we are going to speed up the proceedings this week. Last week we went very slowly and as a result we missed out on some of the things I wanted to complete. So I will quickly finish those in the beginning. We discussed last week what are sequences, what is meant by the convergence of a sequence and using that we talked about the continuity of a function. There are some properties of the continuous functions we want to study. The One of the important ones is called intermediate value property. We shall abbreviate it as IVP. It means that if a function takes two values at two points A and B, then any value between those two values, that is between FA and FB, if R is any number which lies between FA and FB, then R is also a value taken by the function at some point between A and B. So every intermediate value is taken. That is why it is called intermediate value property. And here is an example which tells you what the function might look like. So the graph of the function that I have drawn here is if x is negative, then the value is equal to 1. At, at 0, the value is equal to 2 and then it falls off as x equal to uh, uh, then fx equal to x if uh, x is uh, greater than 0. So, for example, if the graph is like this, then at this point the value is here. So, if you look at the value, this is 2 and this is 1. So, if the value here, if you take 1 and half, okay, so it should go up here. So if you look at 1 and half, the 1.5, this value is taken at this point which is here, but it is not taken between a point which lies at which the value is at minus 1, the value is 1, at 0 the value is 2. So between these two values, this value lies, but it should be taken between these two, it is not. Therefore although uh, the value 1 and half is taken, it is not taken between the two points at which the value minus 1 and 2, uh, at, at which the value 1 and 2 are taken. So this does not have the intermediate value property. Why is that? Because suddenly it is minus 1, there is a jump and then it goes down. So this kind of a jump tells you that it does not have intermediate value property. So in case a function has an intermediate value property, one of the consequences is that the range of the function is itself an interval. So if you do not know what is an interval which we discussed last time, so you look at the notes. An interval means if two points belong to the set, then every point in between must belong to the set. That is the definition of an interval. So the range of a function which has intermediate value property is itself a, the range itself is an interval. But the converse is not true and this example shows that the range of the function is from 2 downwards here. So the range is an interval, however, it does not have the intermediate value property. And I want to give you an application of the intermediate value theorem which says that every continuous function has the intermediate value property. So look at the graph. The graph says that a continuous function starts here and goes like this, that curve. Between this value fa and between this value fb, look at any number r. Then this number r is the value of a function between a and b. So if you draw the horizontal line across r, it should cut the graph, okay. So this is the intermediate value theorem. It says that if you have a continuous function, it has to have the intermediate value property. And uh, proof of this theorem is not easy. So I am going to skip the proof and it uses what is called completeness of the real line which we discussed last time. So here, is, here are one or two applications of the intermediate value theorem. Look at this. Start with an odd integer n and look at a polynomial of degree n, okay. 
where the coefficient top coefficient a n is not equal to 0. If a n were equal to 0, it will be a polynomial border n minus 1. So, it will be even degree polynomial. So, we are having an odd degree polynomial. Then the conclusion is such a polynomial has to have at least one root on the real line. What does that mean? If you draw the graph of such a function, it has to cut the real axis once and here is the argument. A n is not equal to 0, so suppose it is bigger than 0. Then the top coefficient A n is bigger than 0 and x to the power n is the dominating term. So, if you divide throughout by x to the power n, you will get A n plus A n minus 1 divided by x and so on. So, when x becomes positively large, all the later terms fall off and the dominating term A n remains. So, it means that for some b big enough, the value of the function p that is the polynomial is positive. By the same, same token, you will see that if you take a, a negatively large number, at some time the value will be negative. So, here is the picture. At b, the value of the function is positive. At a, the value of the function is negative. This is p of b and this is p of a. So, the function p as we have seen last time is a continuous function being a polynomial. So, it has the intermediate value property. What does it mean? If the value at a is negative, at value at b is positive, every value between p a and p b is taken. In particular, this is negative, this is positive. So, the value 0 is in between. So, it is taken. Means what? If you draw the graph of the function, it has to cut at least once. Maybe it will cut more than once. We do not know. So, this shows very quickly that every odd degree polynomial has a real root, right. For us, a root means always a real root. We are not going to talk about complex numbers. So, always whenever say there is a root, how many roots are there, find out all the roots, I always mean real roots. Now, the second example here shows that the polynomial does not have to be an odd degree to have a root. For example, to look at this polynomial x to the power 4 plus twice x cube minus 2. It has a root. In fact, it has a root between 0 and 1. You may not be able to actually calculate it, but you can say there has to be a root. Why? What is the value at 0? The value of the function at 0 is minus 2. What is the value at 1? 1 plus 2 minus 2 plus 1. So, at 0 it is negative. At 1 it is positive. What does it mean? It has to cut somewhere in between. So, it has to have a root. Okay. So, these are quick applications. Today in the evening, in the tutorial, we shall do similar problems and so on. So, this completes what I wanted to do last time and we begin with a new property of uh, continuous functions. The second property, it is known as the extreme value property or extreme value theorem that is satisfied by continuous functions. What does it say? Well, before I tell you the statement, I want to recall for you what is meant by a function being bounded. A bounded function just like a sequence being bounded. What does that mean? A sequence bounded. If a n is the sequence, then it is bounded. If mod a n is less than or equal to alpha for all n and for some fixed alpha. Similarly, a function is bounded means mod f x is less than or equal to alpha for all x in the domain. If you look at the picture of such a such a function, you should keep always the geometric idea in the mind. When we have a definition, see what it means. Where is minus alpha? Minus alpha is here. Where is alpha? Alpha is here somewhere. f x in absolute value less than or equal to alpha means what? It lies in the band from minus alpha to plus alpha. So, if you draw the graph of the function, whatever be the domain, it will lie like, it will never go up here, it will never go down there. So, bounded means lying between two layers, two horizontal straight lines, okay, minus alpha, alpha, that is bounded. We say that the function attains its bound, means if you look at the supremum of the function over the domain, what is the supremum? It is not the maximum, maximum if the supremum is taken, but supremum, what is supremum? We learned last time, least upper bound, means it is an upper bound and it is the smallest such a upper bound. Why is there always such a least upper bound? That is the completeness of the real line we studied last time. So, 
there should be a point x1 at which the supremum is taken and there should be a point x2 where the infimum is taken. What is infimum? Greatest lower bound. It's a lower bound and it is the greatest one. Why does it exist? It follows from the completeness of the real line. Okay. So, in short, what does it say? Attains its bound means the function has a maximum. Is it not? It is a supremum taken by the function at a point means it becomes the maximum. Similarly, there is an infimum taken by the function at a point that means it is the minimum. So, the extreme value theorem says that if you have a function which is continuous on a closed and bounded interval, here is the closed and bounded interval AB. If you have a function which is continuous on such an interval, then first it is bounded. Second, not only it is bounded, the upper bound that is the least upper bound, the supremum is taken. That means there is a maximum, right? And there is a infimum which is taken. That means the minimum is exists. So, what you should remember is this. If you have a closed and bounded interval and a continuous function on it, then there is a minimum for the function taken at some point on the interval, maximum of the function taken at some point. If you re remove some of the hypotheses that suppose you have an interval which is not closed, let us say half open, half closed or if the interval is not bounded, starts with A, goes all the way to infinity, that is also an interval. On such other intervals, the theorem is false and I have listed some examples, I have no time to discuss those. but. You look at those examples where if you remove one of the hypotheses, closeness or boundedness, or if you remove the hypothesis, the function is continuous, then the maximum minimum will not be taken. Maybe the function will not be bounded at all, or if maybe it is bounded, but the maximum, there is no maximum, there is no minimum. There is supremum and infimum, but no maximum and minimum. So here are all these one, two, three, four examples. I do not have time to discuss those things. They are simple ones, one upon x, x and so on. So they are not difficult examples, but you convince yourself that the hypotheses of the theorem are not just like that, put there. They are needed. If you drop the hypothesis, the theorem is false, okay. Fine. Now, we come to a new topic called limits of functions of a real variable. If you see in most books and most courses, the limits of functions of a real variable are treated first and then you come to continuity. I have reversed the procedure because understanding continuity with the help of what is meant by convergence of a sequence is the easiest thing you can imagine. What is the definition of a function being continuous? A function f defined on a domain d taking real values and if you have a point c in the domain d, when is it called continuous at d? Very simple, very simple. The definition of continuity, so f continuous at c, this definition means whenever xn is a sequence in D, if xn converges to C, then this should imply f of xn should converge to f of C. This is a very simple definition. There is no epsilon, there is no delta, there is nothing. But they are lying there somewhere. Where are they lying? You should know what is meant by sequence converging to a point. This is also another sequence converging to some other point. So, if you know what is meant by convergence of a sequence, continuity is immediate, very easy to understand. So, that is why I said last week that convergence of a sequence is the most basic concept in this course. If you understand that concept well, everything will fall in place. You will see today. For example, so this is continuity. For this, what is needed? The point C should be in the domain, that is all, nothing else. Now, here is a slight difference from continuity, limit. This concept differs from the concept of continuity in two places and I will tell you where it places. First of all, the point C may not be in the domain. However, there is a neighborhood about C or some interval about C except for C should lie in the domain. So, here is the first difference. Here C belongs to the domain. Now, you have function f from D to C, a D to R. C may not be in the domain. However, if you look at C minus R to C, that is sorry, to C, that is a open interval on the left and if you look at C to C plus R, what is the picture? Here is C. This may not be in the domain, but a open interval like this, C minus R to C, 
and c to c plus r, this is c plus r, this is c minus r, this interval is in the domain, okay. Sometimes we call this a punctured neighborhood because you have punctured it at c, c may not be there, may be there, may not be there. So you have a function like this and then the same definition repeat. What is the definition? Xn should be sequence in D, Xn should converge to C, C may not be in the domain but Xn converges to C. This should imply f of Xn should converge to what? I can't say f of C, why? Because C may not be in the domain. So what, what is the point of saying f at C? C is not in the domain. So we say that the limit of the function as x tends to C exists if there is some number L, some real number L such that f of xn converges to L. So if there is some L in the real line such that whenever you have a sequence xn converging to C, f of xn should converge to that one fixed number L. If this happens, then we say that the limit of fx as x tends to C exists and is equal to L. It is easy to see that there cannot be two different limits because no matter what sequence xn converges to C, f of xn has to converge to L. If there are two limits L1 and L2, f of xn will converge to L1 and also to L2. But we saw last time the limits of sequences are unique, so there cannot be two. Now there are two comments I want to make and you try to understand them as clearly as you can. I will give you some examples to illustrate these comments. What are the comments? This says that whenever xn converges to C, f of xn has to converge to that same number L. So this L does not depend on which sequence I am taking. No matter what, how I approach C by xn, a sequence, f of xn has to go to the same number L, okay. This is the most important point. So if you want to show some function f does not have a limit as x tends to C, how will you show? You will find one sequence xn which converges to C, but f of xn does not converge at all, end of the matter the function will not have a limit or you may find one fun one sequence xn converging to C, f of xn will converge to some numbers let us say 2 and some other sequence xn converging to C, C only but f of xn will converge not to 2 but to 3. So if two different sequences take you to two different places, the limit does not exist. Do you understand this? All right. So what are the differences between continuity and limits? Both are very similar definition. Here C has to be in the domain, here C need not be in the domain. Here f of xn has no choice but to go to the value of the function at C, that is continuity. Here it may go to the value of the function at C if C is in the domain, but C may not be in the domain, so it will not go. Even if it is in the domain, it need not go to the value of the function, some number L. Okay, so these are the two main differences. I will give you some examples to illustrate this. Look at this function f which is defined on the real line and is defined in a rather artificial manner. What is it? 3x minus 1 if x is not 0 and at 0 it is equal to 1. Question whether the limit of the function exists as x tends to 0. What do you do? Look at a sequence xn which converging to 0 and ask yourself does f of xn converge to the same limit. Um, I uh, retract my last statement. I wrote down some definition here, right. Xn sequence, sequence xn in D. I wrote down. Please correct it. I am good I made a mistake so that you will not make a mistake. The, the sequence xn is not in D, you should exclude the point C. Take a sequence xn which lies in D, but none of the elements of the sequence xn is equal to C. So if you have written down the notes, there it is written correctly. See here, 
xn is a sequence in D, xn not equal to C. Xn, none of the terms of the sequence should equal C because we are keeping C away. When you look at the limit as x tends to C, C is not of importance. Only what happens near C is importance, okay. So I should have written here, by the way, you know this notation, no? Things in D not equal to C or if you do not want to use this notation, xn in D, xn, none of the xn's is equal to C, okay. So good, I was reminded. So this is an important difference between continuity and limits, okay. So again, recollect, continuity, C has to be in the domain. xn is a sequence in D converging to C. Then f of xn converge to f of C. Limit, C need not be in D. The sequence should not be in D. None of the elements of the sequence xn is in D. xn converging to C, xn not equal to C, should imply f of xn should converge to some number L. Whether it is the value of the function at C or not, does not matter, okay. So uh, that is what I just I wrote down. So let us look at this example. So what am I supposed to do? I am supposed to take a sequence xn, xn not equal to 0 because I am looking at the limit at 0. So I exclude 0 from my consideration. If xn is not equal to 0, the definition of the function says that f of xn will be 3xn minus 1, 3xn minus 1 converges to, yes, xn converges to 0, so 3xn converges to 0 minus 1. No matter which sequence I take xn, this is the case, therefore the limit exists. Although at 0 suddenly the value of the function is something different, it does not matter. So at, when you look at the limit of a function, what the value of the function is at 0, whether the value is defined at 0 or not is all unimportant. Let us look at one more example. <coughs> Is, here is a polynomial of degree n as we saw earlier. Take any real number c. Suppose xn converges to c and I am required to say that xn is not equal to c because I am looking at the limit, not at the continuity. For continuity, I will drop this xn not equal to c. All right. f of xn we saw last time that converges to f of c because of the limit theorems that we used last time. So limit of f of xn is equal to L where L happens to be the value of the function. That is not important, but there is an L and so on. So the limit here ex exists. Let us look at one more example, fx equal to bracket x. Everyone knows what bracket x is, greatest integer not greater than x. It goes in steps, 0, 1, 2, etc. I am, uh, I want to look at the limit as x tends to 1. What am I supposed to do? I look at all possible sequences which converge to 1, all possible sequences. That is an arbitrary sequence converging to 1. I ask myself, is there a number L such that f of xn will always go to that L? Now if you look at the graph of the function at 1, what is the value of the function before 1? Greatest integer not greater than 1, what is it? 0. So the value of the function is here and 1 onwards the value of the function is here, okay. So obviously there is a jump. Now if I look at a sequence xn here, for example, xn is equal to 1 minus 1 upon n, does f of xn converge somewhere? f of xn, what is the greatest integer not greater than 1 minus 1 upon n? 0. So f of xn is equal to 0. Does it converge somewhere? Yes, it converges to 0. On the other hand, if I look at xn dash here, let us say xn dash equal to 1 plus 1 by n, so the values are somewhere here, okay. What is f of xn dash, f of xn dash, what is the greatest integer not greater than 1 plus 1 by n? 1, so 1. Does it converge somewhere? it converges. So in both cases, this sequence makes f of xn converge to 0, this sequence makes f of xn dash converge to 1. So is there a single number L to which every time a sequence xn is converging to 1, xn not equal to 1, is there a single number? No, we found two sequences, one takes you to 0, one takes you to 1. 
conclusion limit does not exist you follow me so this is one way of showing limit does not exist point two sequences going to the point c none of the terms of the sequence is equal to c f of xn for one xn goes somewhere f of xn for another xn goes somewhere else okay one more example sin 1 by x i want to know whether the limit of f of x as x tends to 0 exists now sin 1 by x last time i drew the picture how does the picture sin 1 by x? every time you don't have to draw the picture sometimes it is impossible to draw the picture but it gives you an idea so use the picture as an idea giving you an idea you don't have to insist on drawing a picture so sin 1 by x goes like this near 0 right we saw that so at some places it goes very fast oscillation here and fast oscillation here this is plus 1 this is minus 1 it always lies between plus 1 and minus 1 so you will see near 0 I can choose points at which the value of the function is 1 and near 0 I can also choose points they go down here the value is equal to minus 1 so if I take the sequence xn going to 0 where the values of the function are always equal to 1 then f of xn will go to 1 because they are always 1 on the other hand if I take another sequence here where the values are minus 1 they will go to f of xn will go to minus 1 again by the same logic the limit does not exist perhaps we can take a sequence where f of x n has no limit at all for example here is a sequence that i have written here sin of n plus 2 n plus 1 pi by 2 at pi by 2 what happens to the sign because this is a reciprocal so i have to take x n is 2 upon 2 n plus 1 pi uh, it is sine of 1 by x so i take the reciprocal so at pi by 2 what happens sine is 1 at 3 by by 2 it is minus 1 then again plus 1 minus 1 so at this point 2n plus 1 pi by 2 the sign is the value of the function is minus 1 to the power n right does it converge it does not we saw last time everything boils down to what happens to the convergence of a sequence right again and again I am emphasizing point remember how to treat sequences if you treat them well and you understand them well rest of it is simple so here is a sequence xn for which f of x f of xn tends to 0 all right xn is not equal to 0 but f of xn does not converge at all forget about converging to some fixed l right so there are two ways you can show the limit does not exist find two different sequences taking you at two different places or find single sequence where the limit does not exist like here all right so these are some of the examples that you keep in mind now this is a comparison between limits and continuity i have already talked to you about so let me just go very quickly for a limit to exist i said the point c need not be in the domain but something nearby should be in the domain now if i want continuity to be considered and limit to be considered what am i forced for continuity the point c should be in the domain for limit the nearby points should be in the domain what does it mean a full interval about c should be in the domain then i can consider continuity as well as limit and then i compare the two so such a point a point c in a domain d is called an interior point that is the definition that is written interior point this is an important def definition if if there is r greater than 0 such that c minus r to c plus r is contained in d what does it mean take a point in c question is it an interior point look nearby some open interval about that point should be also in the domain then c is called an interior point so at an interior point i can talk about a continuity i can talk about limit how do they compare that is what this says. So, for a function to be continuous at an interior point, Fc has to be defined. Yes, C is an interior point. So, it is a point of the domain. Limit must exist because C has nearby points in the domain. So, I can talk about the limit. If nearby points are not in the domain, I cannot talk about the limit. If C is not in the domain, I cannot talk about continuity, but I can now talk, talk about both. So, if I am able to talk about both, when 
does a function happen to be continuous exactly when the limit L which is supposed to exist is no other than the value of the function. Now this is what you must have studied long back in your JE days or even later limit exists if and only if the, uh, the, the sorry the function is continuous if and only if the value is well defined of the function at that point the limit exists and they are equal right remember so we have come back to that but we came by two ways one talking about continuity one talking about limit separately now they have joined together all right so that is what it is now these are known as limit theorems for functions of a real variable let me remind you about limit theorems for sequences if the limits and continuity are defined in terms of sequences whatever theorems are there for sequences as far as limits are concerned corresponding theorems will be for limits for example it says that if the limits as x tends to c of fx and gx exist limit of f plus g exists and is equal to sum of the limits how to prove take a sequence xn converging to c f of xn will converge to some l g of xn will converge to some l dash f of xn plus g of xn will converge to l plus l dash this is true for every sequence finished end of the matter so the proofs are trivial if you know the results about limit theorems or sequences so everything goes back to the limit i will not spend much time it is about the product it is about the quotient you have to be careful about the quotient that the limit of the denominator should not be zero otherwise you will be dividing by zero then if f is less than or equal to g always and whenever x is near c but x not equal to c then the limit of f will be less than or equal to limit of g similarly for the sandwich theorem if h is caught between f and g for x near c but not equal to c and the limit of f and limit of g is the same l then the limit of h will have to be the same l so everything that we did for sequences goes through so that's what i wrote here is a one line proof proofs follow from the limit theorems or sequences so go to sequences and you are done now one or two examples about how to show limits exist and uh, maybe how to show limits don't exist both all right so let's look at the function sin x and x lies in absolute value between 0 and pi by 2 okay so it is the right half plane what is the domain here mod x lies between so this is the domain except for 0 because I am looking at limit at 0 so I can exclude 0 so here are two inequalities I have written down here uh, probably in your trigonometry and so on you have been using those and so on I hope but you, you may not have proved them as such we shall have occasion to prove this so I have written as we shall see later we will prove this so sin x always lies between mod x and minus mod x and 1 minus cos x also lies between mod x and minus mod x these are inequalities they can be proved rigorously we shall prove them when we come to differentiation and some similar results what does it say as x tends to 0 what happens to mod x goes to 0 what happens to minus mod x goes to 0 what will happen to something in between go to 0 so limit of sin x as x tends to 0 is 0 by the sandwich theorem what about here this goes to 0 this goes to 0 so in between goes to 0 that means limit of cos x as x tends to 0 is equal to 1 okay what is the value of cos at 0 1 is the limit equal to the value yes therefore cosine function is continuous at 0 same thing about sine what is the value of sine at 0 0 limit is equal to 0 therefore sine is a continuous we have proved these things now today now let us look at <coughs> function x cos x so x cos x is less than sin x less than x this inequality is also is valid for x between 0 and pi by 2 we shall again prove this inequality you will be able to prove it little later so divide throughout by x x is not 0 so I divide throughout by x what happens here x cos x divided by x cos x here x divided by x 1 right hand side tends to 1 left hand side tends to 1 we just showed cos x goes to 1 left hand side tends to 1 right hand side tends to 1 something in between has to tend to 1 
that means sin x upon x tends to 1. So, we have proved this result now sin x upon x as x tends to 0 is equal to 1. All right. Now, the last example, example where to how to show some majorization, majorization can be used f x equal to x times sin 1 by x. I think last time on the board I drew a picture of the graph of x sin 1 by x. Do you remember? So, this is the graph of y equal to sin 1 by x, x not equal to 0. If I want to draw the graph of y equal to x sin 1 by x, x not equal to 0, will the graph be very similar? Similar, but different. Why so? Because I am multiplying by x. So, the value of this function does not exceed x when x is positive and minus x when x is negative. So, this is y equal to x, this is y equal to minus x. So, where will the graph of this function lie? Between these two crossing lines. So, the graph is like this. It is good we are able to draw the graph, I mean not exactly, but approximately, but you do not have to draw the graph. So, the graph tells you that as x tends to 0, either from the left or from the right, the value of the function gets squeezed between these two lines. These two lines meet at 0, is it not? y equal to x, y equal to minus x, they meet at 0. It is squeezed. What does that say? The limit goes to 0, is it not? Well, if the picture does not convince you and perhaps it should not convince you, look at the proof. Minus mod x less than or equal to x sin x less than or equal to mod x. Do you agree? That is what it means to say that it lies between the uh, graphs y equal to x and y equal to minus x. Take absolute value of this. It is less than or equal to mod x, is it not? Sin of no matter which angle is less than or equal to 1 in absolute value. So, mod of x sin x, if you look at the mod of this, x sin x is less than or equal to mod of x. That means sin x lies between mod x and minus mod x. Where does mod x go? 0. Where does minus mod x go? 0. What will happen to something in between? Go to 0. That means x sin x limit of this is equal to 0. Okay. This function is not defined at 0, but if I happen to define the function at 0 to be equal to 0, will this function be continuous? Yes. The limit is 0, we just showed value is defined to be equal to 0, function is continuous. If I define this function at 0 to be equal to 3, will the function be continuous? No. The limit exists, the value is there, but they are not equal. So, it will not be there. So, it depends on how you define it at 0. Fine. Okay. So, these are the examples. Now, this I am going to go very quickly, just uh, show you the slides and I said read out. Instead of xn converging to c from anywhere, that means either from the left or from the right or sometimes from the left, sometimes from the right. For example, if I take the sequence x n to be equal to minus 1 to the power n divided by n, what happens to this sequence? Does it go to 0? Does this go to 0? Yes or no? Take the absolute value of the sequence. It is mod n, mod 1 upon n. It goes to 0. So, the sequence goes to 0. Does it go to 0 from above or from below? No, it goes like this. Understand? So, sequences can be very ill behaved. They may always come from above, always come from below. They make once below, once above, once below, once above, whichever way. Suppose I require that the sequence xn converges to c, but xn is always bigger than c, strictly bigger than c. Okay? While talking about the limit, xn is not equal to c. So, it has two choices. What are the choices? Bigger than C, smaller than C. It is so simple in the real line case. When we go to R2, it is going to be much, much more difficult. There are many, many more choices. But for the real line, there are only two choices. Xn less than C always, Xn bigger than C or both ways. So, if Xn is always bigger than C, then the same definition goes through to say that the limit of the function as x tends to c from above exists or it is sometimes called right hand limit. It comes from the right hand, no? my right hand like this. 
xn is bigger, this is c, xn is bigger than c, xn converges to c, need not be monotonical, may, it may go plus minus plus minus, but always rise, rise to the, lies to the right, then right hand limit, left hand limit, here is c, xn is converging to c from, from below, then we say left hand, finish, when will the limit exist, if the right hand limit exists, left hand limit exists and is equal to, the, both are equal. That's all. So let me go th through this quickly. I will not spend time re reading these slides and uh, maybe give you one example. Here, more greatest integer not greater than x. What does it say? Greatest integer not greater than x. So maybe we should look at this. At 0, I want to look at it. greatest integer not greater than 0, from 0 onwards the value is equal to 1, is it not up to here, it suddenly goes here and just before 0 what is the value, minus 1, is it not, so this is 0, this is 1, this is minus 1, so if I require that the sequence xn converges to 0 from above, the values are all 0. So the right hand limit is equal to 0, that is what I have written here, uh, is that wrong, oh I am looking at 1, not at 0, on the slide, not looking at 0, but at 1, it does not matter, it is the same story, at 1, the value of the function is 1 and above 1, up to 2, the value is 1 and before 1, <coughs> open here, 0. So, if I look at a sequence xn here, which is, sorry, xn is not out there, xn is in the domain, so xn is here, if I look at a sequence bigger than 1 and allow xn to tend to 1, then the values are all up here, so the limit will be equal to 1. So if you look at the limit from the right, it will be equal to 1, whereas if I look at the sequences xn here, which are below 1 and I allow xn to tend to 1 here, then the values are always 0 here. So the left hand limit will be equal to 0, but the right hand limit will be equal to 1. They are not equal, therefore the limit of the function does not exist. So this is the theorem I just talked to you about. If you have a point C such that the there is a left hand interval contained in the domain, right hand interval from C onwards contained in the domain, mind well, to talk about the right hand limit, I only need points to the right of C to be in the domain, I do not care about the left of C. To talk about left hand limit, I need only the points on the left to be in the domain, the right hand points do not matter. But if I want to talk about both the limits, both left interval and right interval, they have to be in the domain and this limit will exist if and only if both exist and they are equal. So that is a nice exercise to prove and I suggest that you look at it. How will you prove this? Go back to the sequences, always go back to the sequences and you will, the proof will suggest yourself. Now I am going to do something which I have avoided so far because I know people are afraid of epsilon delta and all that, so I have kept it away. I have only talked about X, Xn convergence, but sometimes these things are useful and I want to expose you this epsilon delta definition so called, I have called it equivalent condition for continuity. This is, this is exactly what, it says exactly the same thing as I have told you earlier, but they were in simple terms. This is something little more sophisticated, I agree, but nothing to be afraid of, I will explain to you. All right, this first part we have already seen yesterday, yesterday means last week function is continuous at a point C, if and only if the following epsilon delta definition holds. What is this epsilon delta definition? I will read it and I will <coughs> draw a picture on the board and I will try to convince you how it is the same as what we did earlier. For every epsilon greater than 0, means I give you epsilon, choice of epsilon is me. I say epsilon equal to 0 0.0001, it's my choice. What are you supposed to do? 
you are supposed to produce a delta bigger than 0, no matter how small, it does not matter, maybe big, whatever it is, you have to produce a delta such that whenever x is away from c by less than delta, fx will be away from fc by less than epsilon. Let me draw a picture. If you have seen the notes of last week, you will have seen the picture, but let me draw it and convince you. Here is your c. Where is f of c? We are talking about continuity. So, c is in the domain. So, f of c is somewhere here. Let us call this is f of c. Okay. I give you an epsilon such that something must happen. What must happen? f of x minus f of c is less than epsilon. That means what? fx lies away from fc by maximum epsilon to the right, epsilon to the left. How do I draw the picture here? This is f of c. What is f of x plus c? f of x, sorry, f of c plus epsilon is here. This is f of c and this is f of c minus epsilon. fx mod minus fc is less than epsilon. What does it mean? fx for x nearby c, how nearby is what you have to tell me. But if you produce a delta, appropriate delta, what must happen? f of x must lie within epsilon of f of c. Picture wise, what does it mean? This is f of c. Within epsilon means between these two lines, is it not? So, if I draw this line and draw this line, if x is near c by how much whatever delta you are going to produce. So, if I go from c to c plus delta that means here and go to c minus c minus delta. So, if x lies here then f of x must lie between these two. So, the graph of the function on the interval c minus delta to c plus delta has to lie between these two lines. Okay. Of course, it has to pass through c because f c is the value of the function at c. So, I am taking a epsilon neighborhood or epsilon interval about f of c up and down. So, if I want to draw the graph, it has to pass through like this. The graph here cannot go whatever the point x is here x, f of x has to lie between these two lines. It cannot go up here, it can go, it cannot go down here, all right. So, this is the picture of continuity. If you are given a function, how do you produce delta? That is the whole problem, no? I give you epsilon, you have to produce a delta. How do you produce it? Here is a pictorial way, not always possible because you cannot draw graphs all the time, but it gives you an idea. So, here is the picture. Suppose this is my function, huh? just drawn. Here is my point C. Here is f of C. Okay, I give you an epsilon. So here is f of f of c plus epsilon. Here is f of c minus epsilon. F of c plus epsilon. Here is f of c minus epsilon. I want to produce a delta here such that when x is restricted to this domain, c minus delta to c plus delta, the graph of the function will lie within these two lines. Now function that I have drawn is so easy that I can do the following. What do I do? I see where it crosses. I do not want it to cross, so I drop here. I see where it crosses. So, if this is c plus delta and if this is c minus delta, so I choose delta to be this distance. Maybe this distance is not equal to this one. What do I do? I take the smaller of the two. Right? I want both the conditions to happen. What are the two conditions? It cannot go above this, it cannot go below this. So, if this is 2 and this is 1, I take 1, delta equal to 1. So, for delta equal to 1, c minus 1 to c plus 1, the graph will always lie. This is the graph. Have I produced delta which does the job? It does. This is an idea of how to find a delta pictorially. It is not always possible because graphs are not so simple and so on. But you must make an attempt to find a delta which will work. And perhaps one of the tutorial classes and so on 
we shall try to find delta in this manner. All right. Now compare this what happens to the definition of a limit. Remember the compare and contrast between limit and continuity. C need not be in the domain for the limit, but nearby points must be. So there is a number r such that between C minus r, C minus r to C and C to C per r must be in the domain. There is a number l such that the following again epsilon delta condition holds. What is it? For every epsilon there is a delta such that for every x in D which is away from C by less than delta, look here, C x is away from C by less than delta. What is the difference between this and this? The difference is I have written here 0 strictly less than. What does it mean? I exclude x equal to c. Is it not? If I say 0 less than or equal to x minus c, does x equal to c satisfy this equation? Inequality? Yes. But if I write 0 less than x minus c, distance between x and c must be strictly bigger than 0, means x cannot be c. Okay. So, for a limit, instead of nothing, writing nothing here, I must write 0 strictly less than. And on the right hand side, here fx has no chance but to go to fc, but here fx can go anywhere, but to the same place. You follow me? For various sequences, it must go to the same L, but this L may not be the value of the function at c, because I am not asking about continuity. So, these two definitions epsilon and delta for continuity and limit are very, very similar with two differences. What is the first difference? Here x equal to c is considered, x equal to c not considered. What is the difference here? fx must go to nowhere else but fc. Here fx can go anywhere else, but not to different places, one single place. That single place need not be the value of the function. The function may not be defined, so there is no question about the value, all right. So these are the two epsilon delta definitions of the limit and you can convince yourself and if you need some help, I will show you how to do it in the tutorial class and so on. This way of writing the definition of a limit is exactly what I wrote earlier in terms of the sequences, but I still say that remember the definition in terms of the sequences, it is much easier to implement and much easier to find out for yourself whether the limit exists or not. This definition is useful in some cases and I will show you when it is useful. Let us take an example, fx equal to x upon mod x and everyone draw the graph of this function. I have been talking about being able to draw the graph. Please draw the graph of the function fx equal to mod x on the whole real line by the time I erase the board. Not it? It is simple or difficult? Huh? Huh? Fx. No, it is not mod x. x upon mod x. Look, fx is equal to x upon mod x. When x is not equal to 0. Because I cannot divide by 0. What are the values of the function possible? Huh? What are the values of the function? Plus 1 and minus 1. If x is positive, the value is plus 1, is it not? x is positive, mod x equal to x. x is negative, the value is minus 1. So, the graph of the function is very simple to draw. It is plus 1 here, minus 1. That is the graph of the function. Okay. Question, does the limit of the function as x tends to 0 exist? That is a question. Limit of fx question mark. First, is 0 in the domain? No. Does it have to be in the domain? No. For the limit, 0 need not be in the domain. Still, we can ask whether the limit exists provided after 0 there is an interval, before 0 there is an interval in the domain. Is that the case? Yes. This interval is in the domain and this interval is also in the domain. 
right? Therefore, we can ask the question. How do you tell whether <coughs> the limit exists or not? Sequence wise, if you find two sequences, both tending to 0, for one f of xn goes somewhere and for the other f of xn goes somewhere else, end of the matter, the limit does not exist. So, if I take a sequence xn, for example, 1 plus 1 by n, if I take xn, they all lie here, right? Where is f of xn? Over here. Where does it go? Does it go to some limit? Yes, it goes to 1. Because the always the value is 1, 1, 1, 1. Where will it go? To 1. Is it not? Value of f of xn, this implies f of xn is equal to 1. The value is always equal to 1. It goes to 1 as n tends to infinity. If I look at xn to be equal to 1 minus 1 by n, this implies f of xn, what is the value? The value is always minus 1 because you can see the graph. So, graph helps you, but graph is not always necessary. So, f of xn is minus 1. It is the sequence is minus 1, minus 1, minus 1. What is the limit of the sequence? Minus 1. Have we proved that the limit does not exist? Yes, because you have found two sequences both converging to 0, none of the terms of the sequence is equal to 0, one takes you somewhere to plus 1, the other takes you somewhere else to minus 1, therefore the limit does not exist, right? Now let us look at the epsilon delta wave, it is involved, but you should get used to thinking in these manners. So suppose it says, the proof says, suppose there is a limit L, right? I want to show there is no limit L, what I must do? Suppose there is L and I get a contradiction, okay. At the end of the proof, I will remind you of something which we have done last week in a similar manner. So, suppose there is an L, so the limit as x tends to 0 is equal to L. What must happen for every epsilon band above, there has to be a delta interval below so that the values of the function fall into the same band, epsilon band, right? That is the definition. So, I take epsilon to be equal to half. Hmm? So, I take the band around L, L plus half, L minus half. I do not know where is L, there is some L somewhere. Now, because I have assumed that the limit is L, Fx and L must differ from each other by less than epsilon, but epsilon is half. So, there is a delta such that when X lies between minus delta to plus delta, Fx minus L has to lie. Uh, fx minus l must be less than half. That is what the limit definition tells you. All right. So, suppose take x naught equal to delta by 2. Does it satisfy this inequality 0 less than mod x less than delta? It does. So, x naught satisfies this. Therefore, if I put x equal to x naught, I must get it. That is fx naught minus l must be less than half. But I look at minus x naught. Does minus x naught, that is minus delta by 2, does it satisfy this inequality? It does because I am taking absolute value. So, minus x naught must also satisfy this inequality. That is f of minus x naught minus l must be also less than half. But f at x naught is equal to 1 because x naught is positive. f at minus x naught is minus 1 because there are only two values, plus 1, minus 1, so minus 1. So, both have to be satisfied by triangle inequality, you will say that f at x naught minus f of x naught, this is 1, this is minus 1, so minus minus plus 1 which is equal to 2, less than or equal to, triangle inequality says f at x naught minus l plus l minus f at x naught, this is less than half, this is less than half, half. So, 2 less than 1, what a contradiction. Are you reminded of something that we did last week in a similar manner? We tried to prove and proved it, the following result, if a n is equal to minus 1 to the power n, then a n is divergent. Divergent means not convergent. We proved this last week. If you go back and see the proof, it is exactly the proof. After all, what are the terms of this sequence? Plus 1, minus 1. What are the values of the function? Plus 1, minus 1. How can be a different proof? It is the same proof, okay? So, 
so just by way of uh, reminding you of what we did last time in the remaining 20 25 minutes i want to talk to you about a new concept called differentiability okay this one it is always equal to minus 1 the value of f of x n minus this is 1 minus 1 by n right 1 minus 1 by n what, what is the value of the function here minus 1 huh? no 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 for every x positive it is plus 1 is it not for every x negative there is no n tending to infinity for every x negative the value of the function is minus 1 1 minus 1 by n oh oh sorry you are correct <laughs> okay thank you please correct me eh, because i make some mistake while writing and so on so i should take the sequence plus 1 by is it not the sequence is supposed to go to 0 I was carried away by the earlier example where the limit was at 1. Here we are looking at the limit at 0. By the way, this reminds me, if I take the limit at 1, what will happen? Will the limit exist? Yes. Go below 1 or go above 1, it's always equal to 1. So the limit is 1. Thank you very much. At least one person is awake. <laughs> okay. So take the sequence n here and minus 1. All right. Okay. So now we come to differentiability. Again, the definition of differentiability is in terms of definition of a limit the limit definition is in terms of the limit of a sequence so everything again boils down to sequences so here is the definition of a function being differentiable what is written there on the slide you have a point c in the domain of the function no doubt but c is an interior point what does that mean I just define for you what an interior point is. Interior point means not only C is in the domain, but there is a interval, open interval about C, which is also in the domain. To just check, suppose I take D equal to A comma B. What are the interior points of this domain D? Which points are, can I say C is an interior point where is the picture a is here b is here so which points of this domain are interior points yes come on all those about which at least a very small interval lies in the domain this point is it interior yes or no yes why because about this point, I take an interval small enough, which will lie here. Is the point B in the dom interior point? No, B itself is not there. Question of some interval about it lying in the domain doesn't appear. So B is not. Is this an interior point? No, it's way away. Is this an interior point? No. What about A? Is A an interior point? No, because for A to be an interior point, an interval open interval about that point has to be contained in the domain so if i take an interval about a this part is fine it is in my domain but no matter how small an interval i take the left part goes outside so a is not an interior point okay so in short a point is an interior point if you are at the point and you are wishing to move a little bit here a little bit there you should be able to move and stay in the domain. So what we call, there should be elbow room about you to be in the domain. Follow me? So interior point means some small interval about it must be in the domain. So for differentiability, at the moment at least, we are looking at a point C, which is an interior point. And then we create a new function. F was the given function. The new function, this is sometimes called difference quotient. So you go ahead of c by h and subtract from it the value at c or if h is negative you go below c and subtract from it the same value the functional value at c and divide by how much you have moved okay so 
here is C. This is if H is positive, C plus H is here. If H is negative, C minus H is here. F of C is here. F of C plus H may be here. F of C plus C minus H may be here. It depends on the function. So look at F of C plus H minus F of C. Divide it by the distance between C and C plus H if H is positive. If h is negative, you do the same thing. Divide by h, h itself, not minus h, h itself. By looking at the distance between f of c plus h, this is, if h is negative, this will be c plus h minus f of c. So this is known as a difference quotient. Why it is called a difference quotient? Because it's a quotient f of c plus h minus f of c that is the numerator and divided by h. I am looking at the limit as h tends to 0. When I look at limit as x tends to c, x is never equal to c, right? Because c is excluded from our consideration, I just told you. Similarly, when I look at limit as h tends to 0, h is not equal to 0. Therefore, I can divide by h. Otherwise, you should always ask me, ah, you are dividing by h, it should not be 0, h is not 0 because we are taking limit as h tends to 0. We are not talking about continuity, we are talking about the limit of the difference quotient. So if this difference quotient which is a function of a real variable, which is the real variable here? h, h is the variable because h is moving, right? h is going to 0, limit of fx as x tends to c, so x is the variable. This is limit of certain function, the difference quotient as h tends to 0. If this limit exists, then we say that the function is differentiable at c and the limit is called the derivative of the function at c. So geometrically speaking, you know, how will it look like? So let us draw a picture here. So this is f of c plus h, this is c, this is f of c plus h. So this and this is c plus h. So this distance divided by this, is it not? f of c is here and f of c plus h is here. So this distance divided by this distance, that means look if you look at the chord and when h becomes smaller and smaller, this point comes near and near c. So this chord becomes a tangent. So this quotient f of c plus h minus f of c upon h, which is the slope of the chord that I have drawn here, as h tends to 0, so it may tend to 0 from above c or from below c. So this chord turns into a tangent. So geometrically speaking, the derivative exists means there is a tangent to the function at c. Now before I elaborate on the definition and its consequences, I want to make two geometrical ideas fixed in your mind. Continuity roughly speaking means no break in the graph, no jump in the graph. Differentiability geometrically speaking means you are able to draw a unique tangent. This limit is unique, right? Limit from h positive, h negative should exist no matter how a sequence tends to 0, hn is a sequence tending to 0, no matter how it tends to 0, you must get the same number l, whatever that number l, that l is called the derivative, okay. So you are able to draw a unique tangent to the curve, so geometrically it means what we say in uh, common language, the function is smooth, smooth means there are no corners. Continuity means there are no jumps. Differentiability means there are no quarters. A function can have corners but no jumps. For example, x equal to mod x. Does it have a corner? x equal to mod x. This is the graph of the function, is it not? x equal to mod x. fx equal to mod x. When you try to draw the graph of this function, is there a jump? 
No, it's continuous. So remember, when no jump means continuous. But it has a corner. So it's not differentiable. Why? Because if I come from the left, this is my tangent. If I come from the right, this is my tangent. Is it not? So this tangent is different from that tangent, not a unique tangent. So there should be a tangent and the tangent should not be vertical. I will come to that later. Tangent vertical means slope infinite, right? So then this limit will have to be infinite. We don't accept infinity as a limit at the moment. Limit exists means there is a real number L to which the values of the function go. All right, so keep these uh, geometric ideas in your mind and we will proceed. So f dash c can be interpreted also as the rate of change in the function at c because when, for example, you are traveling along the straight line, for example, you start at c, you go to c plus h, you started at f at c, you ended at f at c plus h. So this is the distance traveled divided by the time taken. What will it give you? Average speed, right? So it is called the average or it is called the rate of change of the function at c. That is also not possible. Let's look at very simple examples. So fix our ideas. Suppose fx is constant. What will happen to the numerator? If fx is constant, if I change the variable x from c to c plus h, the value remains the same. Value remains, suppose fx equal to 2 is the constant function. This is equal to 2. This is equal to 2. 2 minus 2, 0. Does the limit exist of 0 upon h? Yes, because the values are always 0. So constant functions have derivative equal to 0. Ha, ha, ha. Simple. But if I ask you the other way around, shall I ask you? If the derivative, so deriv constant function has derivative 0. If the derivative is 0, must the function be constant? Yes or no? On an interval, suppose you have an interval, huh? the derivative is 0. Must the function be constant? Hmm? Because I am asking such pointedly, you are saying no. Answer is yes. But if I ask you the proof, you will not be able to prove it at the moment unless you have read something in advance. We shall be able to prove the converse. Converse is very difficult to prove. If a function is constant, the derivative is 0, this is the proof. This is some value minus the same value, difference is 0 divided by h, h is not 0. So, so constant function has derivative 0, no problem. If the derivative is 0, must the function be constant? I do not know how to prove it now, means from whatever we have learned so far, but we shall be able to prove it in the maybe next week sometime and so on. So keep that in mind, I will again remind you because people take it for granted. A function is constant if and only if the derivative is 0. It is true on an interval, but one way is trivial, which is what this is, but the other way is not at all trivial and we shall see how to do it. All right, fx equal to x. So what will be the numerator? fx equal to x. So what is this? c plus h minus c, c and c cancel, h, h divided by h, 1. So fx equal to x, the derivative is equal to 1 fx equal to x raised to 2 by 3. What will happen? Calculate the difference quotient. So when I ask you to ask a question, is the function differentiable? The first thing and the simplest thing to do is to go to the definition. If that is proving to be complicated, then you have to look at some theorem which says that if this, this, this happens, then the function has to be differentiable. Then you conclude it by using some result or if this, this, this happens, then the function is not differentiable, whatever it is. So first look at the definition. So let us do it here. What is here? f of 0 plus h, h to the power 2 by 3 minus 0 divided by h. What do you get? h to the power 1 by 3. 1 upon h to the power 1 by 3. Does the limit exist? No. h tends to 0, h to the power 1 by 3 also tends to 0. Given epsilon, you should take delta to be equal to epsilon q, and then you will get this. So this limit does not exist. Look at this one more. f0 equal to 0, fx equal to x sin 1 by x. Did we study this function a while ago? Yes. What did we find out about this function? Look at this function going like this between these two lines, like this, like this. We found that the function is continuous. We found that. I say this function is not differentiable. Why so? 
go to the definition f of 0 plus h minus f of 0 that means sin 1 by h minus f of 0 is 0 right and there is an h here is it not x sin 1 by x so f of 0 plus h is h into sin 1 by h minus 0 divided by h h and h cancel sin 1 by h okay so limit of sin 1 by h as h tends to 0 if it exists then the function will be differentiable is it differentiable no because this limit does not exist we studied a while ago no sin 1 by x does not tell you it goes oscillates up and down and so on. so this is a good example of a function which is continuous but not differentiable right this is the second example i have given you what is the first example first example of a function simplest one of a function which is continuous but not differentiable mod x this is a standard example this is one more example a function which is continuous but not differentiable now these are simple matters just like left hand limit and right hand limit we can talk about left hand derivative right hand derivative why after all the derivative is defined in terms of a limit if only the right hand limit exists we will call it the right hand derivative right hand limit of what not the function itself of the difference quotient so keep this these two words in your mind whenever you talk about derivatives it is the difference quotient which is involved you ask whether the limit of the this is the difference quotient does the limit of this difference quotient as the increment h tends to 0 does it exist if it does the function is differentiable so now if you restrict h to be positive that means you are looking at right hand limits so if the right hand limit exists of the difference quotient always then we say we have a right hand derivative if the left hand limit exists then we say it has a left hand derivative and so on when does the limit exist if the left hand limit exists right hand limit exists and they are equal when will the derivative exist if the left hand derivative exists right hand derivative exists they are equal now for a right hand derivative to exist i do not need anything to happen on the left is it not so for example the domain is d here can i talk about the derivative at a can i talk about a function is defined on this domain f can i talk about the derivative of f at a to talk about the derivative of a f at a a has to be an interior point a is not an interior point so we cannot talk about because to the left of a there is nothing so we cannot say anything about the derivative as a whole however if i want to talk only about the right hand derivative can i talk about it yes because i i, ha I have an elbow room to the right so i can talk about f dash at a from the right that you denote as plus here f dash plus a means derivative from the right suppose uh, my domain is like this at b can i talk about right hand derivative no there is nothing on the right can i talk about the left hand derivative <laughs> yes because there is ample room here on the left right so i can talk about f dash at b negative this means left hand derivative this means right hand derivative understand at a point here some let us say a plus b by 2 can I so a is less than b huh? can I talk about left hand derivative yes can I talk about right hand derivative yes when will the derivative exist if left hand derivative exists right hand derivative exists they are equal okay here yeah yes so therefore i included b <laughs> otherwise i cannot so whenever you want to calculate left hand derivative or right hand derivative that point must be in the domain otherwise we cannot write down the difference quotient right? okay so if d is like this we shall say first of all if i look at a function uh, domain d and suppose every point of c is an interior point suppose for example if d is equal to a b 
is every point of D an interior point? Yes. Right. So, if that every point of D is an interior point and if the derivative exists at every interior point, we say that the function is differentiable on D. Just like continuity. When do we say a function is continuous on the domain D? If it is continuous at every point. Similarly, a function is differentiable on the domain D where every point is an interior point if it is differentiable at every point. Suppose you have an interval like this, then we cannot talk about derivative at B because B is not there, but we cannot also talk about the derivative at A, but we can talk about the right hand derivative at A, but that is all we can talk about. Therefore, on the in <coughs> domain like this, we say that the function is differentiable if it is differentiable at all points between A and B and the right hand derivative exists at A. Similarly, if D is equal to A, B, then we shall say that the function is differentiable on this if the derivative exists at each point between A and B and the left hand derivative exists at A, all right, okay. So, if the derivative exists at every point, we can write down for every x in the domain D, we can write down f dash at x, right. So, this creates a new function. The original function f was from D to R. If the derivative exists at every point of D, we get a new function. What is the new function? f dash from D to R. This is known as the derivative function of f or the derivative of f, okay. So, you have a new function. Let us call it g. Then we can ask the same question to g that we ask about f. What is the question? Does g have a derivative? That is g is itself the derivative of f and we ask does g have a derivative? Suppose it does, then we say f has double derivative. Derivative, its derivative, right? So, we say f is twice differentiable, okay and so on. So, n times you can re repeat this process. Uh, these things I have already told you about and uh, this this is called the derivative function and if g itself is differentiable, we say that it is the second derivative, we denote it by f double dash. Huh? f dash is g, so g dash, g dash should be written, g is f, so this is f and we should write like this, but it is too clumsy. So, the bracket is omitted and we write f double dash. How will you write triple derivative? 3 dash. Fourth derivative, oh, it is too bad. How many dashes you can? So, there is a nice way f to the power n with a bracket. See here? So, the nth derivative, I will have to draw n times these dashes, no? So, instead of that, you do like this. This is the nth derivative. You put a bracket to show that it is the derivative, okay? Now, once last comment and then I stop. Many books say let fx be a function on the domain D. This is wrong statement. fx is not a function. What is a function? It generally speaking, vaguely speaking, it is a rule which associates to a point in the domain a point in the range. So, f is the function. What is fx? The value of the function at x. If you open Thomas, your standard book, you will say let fx be a function. This is a wrong statement. fx cannot be a function. f is a function fx is the value of the function at that point, okay? Keep that in mind, all right.